Hi, I'm Mark Beardsley from Ecometrics in Colorado. Me and my friend Karen Boyd from Applied Geomorphology in Montana put this talk together, Breaking Up with Lane, Rethinking Stability and Equilibrium in Stream Restoration. This talks about the natural equilibrium paradigm, the idea that rivers naturally seek a static equilibrium form. It's about how this idea dominated stream management and stream restoration practice for a whole generation. This talks about how the idea became formalized and accepted as dogma in the practice of natural channel design. Mostly it's about when that idea is wrong and why we need to rethink concepts of stability and equilibrium if we hope to gain natural ecological benefits from restoration. Karen and I were discussing the river restoration community's obsession with stable channels one night at a River Restoration Northwest conference and how it really came down to this belief that, you know, that we think rivers naturally seek an ideal equilibrium form according to Lane's balance. We talked about this most of the night, especially about all the reasons why that basic assumption is often wrong in natural systems. If most natural unimpaired rivers and streams are not static, and if they don't always be, if, and if they don't always perfectly balance sediment transport with discharge, then why do we keep insisting that our restored streams have to? It seems like designing stable channels and restoring natural streams may often be two totally different things. And then Karen said it, I think it's time to break up with Lane. We all know Lane's balance. It's the most iconic symbol in our field. If you have a stream channel that's in balance and if you change sediment or stream flow, or if you tweak sediment size or slope, the balance shifts to predict whether the stream will degrade or degrade. Super intuitive, right? Or is it? Lane's balance is named after Emery Lane, and his famous 1955 paper is pretty much just a plea to engineers telling him to pay to pay attention to what a bunch of other guys before him had been saying. The idea of equilibrium in natural streams is most eloquently presented in Henry Mackin's 1948 paper, Concept of the Graded River. But it traces back through William Davis, and then a guy named Grove Gilbert, who is also known as Captain Bold. And then it goes back through a bunch of French guys and eventually to an Italian from the 17th century named Domenico Guglielmi. Did you know that the graphic representation of Lane's balance doesn't appear in anything any of these guys wrote? It appeared mysteriously some time later, and I never did find out who first drew it. It's kind of brilliant, actually. Anyway, I became fascinated by this idea of natural equilibrium. So I spent a couple months doing a deep dive into the scientific literature underpinning the concept. One thing you get from reading the history of equilibrium is a feel for the theory's limitations in both time and space. Turns out that when they spoke of equilibrium, these guys were talking about a pretty small subset of the world's rivers and a pretty narrow range of time scales. The background image is Buffington and Montgomery's famous depiction of the process domains in a watershed. And looking at this, Lane's balance applies only to a subset of those process domains. It applies only to graded streams. And by graded streams, I mean those that are not obviously degrading at the top of watersheds. And those that are not uh, are uh, that are not obviously aggrading at the bottom of watersheds. So I grade out these zones in this diagram. The zone in the middle, the zone of transport, these are the types of process domains where you might find graded streams in equilibrium. And now let's add the y-axis, a time scale. Geomorphic equilibrium doesn't apply over the longest time scales, like millions of years. In these time spans, erosion and deposition are overwhelmed by massive planet scale processes like climate change and uplifting. So let's gray, that, gray out those time scales. And it doesn't apply to human time scales like decades either, because these are too sensitive to the natural fluctuation of state variables. It's mostly threshold responses at this level. So we have to gray out this spot too. And the best way to think about this is that 
all the factors in Lane's equation are actually highly variable functions. The relationship is only valid if you're analyzing at a time scale long enough to get an average over the full range of natural variability for any one of these functions. For example, stream discharge. To plug a number into QW in the equation, you need to be looking at a time scale long enough to include the full range of floods, droughts, and everything in between. You need to be able to with confidence, crash this really dynamic hydrograph into a single number. And that only works at certain time scales. So anyway, you take all that into account, and what do you have left? This space in the middle, this white space. The equilibrium concept only works to explain general trends over hundreds or thousands of years in a select class of rivers. This is the zone where equilibrium might apply. But we aren't done yet. Even within this zone, equilibrium only applies to streams that flow through valleys of deformable material and where sediment discharge is continuous. Well, if geomorphologists have discovered anything in the past 70 years since Mackin's papers, it's that there's a lot of discontinuity out there. These realities further limit the range where equilibrium concepts can even begin to apply these white bands. So you got to stay in your lane, Lane. But of course I knew nothing of all that when I first met Lane. It was love at first sight. We were infatuated. She has that effect on everyone. Lane's balance is intellectually seductive. It suggests order. It suggests equilibrium. And to many, it implies stability. It also kind of seems to suggest justice. Lane's balance became an icon for the natural equilibrium paradigm, the idea that streams naturally seek equilibrium, and that equilibrium is what imparts natural form and function. This is their icon. It implies that equilibrium and stability are inherent qualities of natural functioning stream systems. It implies that stream impairment is a disruption of balance and a loss of stability. It implies that when streams are knocked out of balance, they strive somehow to reestablish it. And it implies that when we find an impaired stream, we can fix it by helping it reestablish its balance. In this way, natural equilibrium is a comfortable and convenient way of thinking about rivers and streams. Let's face it, stream ecosystems are wickedly complex. It's nice to have someone by your side to reassure you that it's actually quite simple, something you can get your head around and something that you can hopefully fix. The idea of a natural balance, it's a powerful heuristic. It's a convenient and conceptual model. But is it a good model or bad model? True models help us focus on what's important. False models lead us astray. Bad models, like bad relationships, make us do dumb things. And I think we've been doing some pretty dumb things lately. The rest of this talk goes into how the natural equilibrium paradigm has been shaping the way my generation of restoration practitioners thought about stability and how we evaluated stream health and function and about how we went about trying to restore healthy streams. Stability. The definition of stream stability that I learned and the one most frequently cited was summarized by Dave Rosgen in using three criteria. His definition states that in order for a stream to be stable, it must, in the present climate, well, <clears throat> now for the sake of argument, let's ignore the fact that the present climate is changing. Okay, this definition states that in order for a stream to be stable in its present climate, the stream must transport the stream flows and sediment of its watershed. And two, it has to maintain its dimension, pattern, and profile. Three, without either a grading or degrading. The definition is founded explicitly on the premise that natural streams strive for equilibrium, the natural equilibrium paradigm. But we know that isn't always true. 
It's really a pretty obscure definition if you think about it. In order to meet these three criteria on a stream, you'd have to hold the needle on lanes balance straight down because stable streams are not supposed to grade or degrade. And then you'd have to fuse both the sliders because stable streams, according to this definition anyway, are not supposed to change form. So where does that leave us? Zero degrees of freedom. No room for adaptation or resilience. And I don't know about you, but I think adaptation and resilience are pretty important characteristics of healthy ecosystems. Here's a naturally healthy stream ecosystem near my house. Let's see how well it meets those three stability criteria in the definition. Well, it does transport the water and sediment of its watershed. So we kind of have to give it number one, but it also retains a healthy portion of each, especially sediment. So I wouldn't really go all the way this stream regularly changes its shape, and it definitely does not exhibit a static form. So number two, maintaining that dimension, pattern, and profile, that's right out. And while I haven't gone out and measured it, there's plenty of science that shows systems like this are slowly aggrading. In fact, this is how you form alluvial valleys. Number three's out. And yet at the same time, there's also good scientific evidence showing that streams like this persist and have persisted for thousands of years. Would you call this system unstable simply because it retains some water and some sediment? Would you call it unstable because it changes shape? Or would you call it unstable because it's slowly aggrading? I wouldn't. Do you think this stream needs any help from us performing its natural functions? Do you think it's broken and so far out of balance it needs restoration? These are the kinds of questions you start asking when you look outside the lens of the natural equilibrium paradigm and apply some good old fashioned common sense. Uh, it's been rough between me and Lane lately. I think we're just growing apart. I think the old definition of stability is a misapplication and misunderstanding of Lane's balance. The concept of stability, oh, it's important, no doubt, but clearly the definition we've been using doesn't capture what we really mean by a stable stream. In the old days, we thought about stability mostly as a factor of resistance to erosion. Is my channel strong enough to, ero to, to, to resist the forces of erosion? Then, Later, and starting with the concept of the Great River, we started thinking a lot more about equilibrium. The channel may not have to be strong, but it has to be in balance, so that way it doesn't change shape. Now, I think it's time for another change. We're starting to realize the importance of adaptability and resilience, the ability to change form. We're talking about a lot more about how well does this system deal with stress. How does it adapt to dynamics and disturbance? There's an increasing, a trend of increasing appreciation of the stochasticity, dynamics, and disturbance in nature. These are all things we know are common in the natural world. Now let's take a look at how the natural equilibrium paradigm directed us in how we evaluate stream health and functional assessment. If we assume that natural functioning streams are supposed to be in stable equilibrium, then evaluating stream function is largely a matter of assessing channel stability. This is the rationale underlying hierarchical frameworks like the stream functions pyramid. The foundation of the pyramid is an assessment of channel stability using hydrological and geomorphological parameters. And the reference we use to evaluate this is a hypothetically stable channel in perfect equilibrium the one on the left. Models like this assume that higher functions, like biogeochemical processes and all the plant and animal communities and stream ecosystem, are a simple product of stability, and mostly they can just be inferred. The real issue is one of reference. If we're evaluating natural function, the proper reference is a natural unimpaired, stre unimpaired stream, not a hypothetically stable one. They're often two different things. Here are two mountain meadow reaches that I study. 
I'm sure that the one on the left is more natural and less impaired. I think it's a better reference for functional assessment, even though it surely is less in balance than the E-channel on the right. But that's because I'm looking at it outside the lens of the natural equilibrium paradigm. In fact, the better function in the natural stream on the left is a direct result of its disequilibrium and dynamic form. Disequilibrium is what drives the formation and maintenance of physical and biological diversity. The riparian and stream biota have evolved with and are dependent upon the complexity of disturbance inherent to a naturally dynamic system. The stream on the left is also more stable, in my mind, by virtue of its ability to adapt, of its ability to be resilient. Now we could try and force that stream on the left into, a, hypothetically anyway, into um, a case of equilibrium. And we could try and get it to behave more like the one on the right, properly conveying its flow and its sediment. And the natural equilibrium paradigm and natural channel design precepts suggest that this is exactly what we should be doing. But if we did that, I think we would wreck it. I think we'd extinguish all the complex natural processes and biotic communities that depend on dynamic, evolving ecosystems. I don't think we'd be doing restoration. I think we'd be doing quite the opposite. Now let's look at what the natural equilibrium paradigm um, at how it guided restoration through natural channel design. The definition of natural channel design is the application of fluvial geomorphology to create stable channels that do not aggrade or degrade. Again, the assumption is that streams are supposed to be naturally stable and that they seek equilibrium. And that functionality, stream functionality, is a product of that stability. Leopold and Maddox said in 1953, that all channel design is based on the premise that natural channels tend toward equilibrium. That was their concept 67 years ago. The goal of natural channel design is a stable equilibrium channel, but there are two ways to get there. In the analytical method, the one on the left, people derive design parameters for channels using equations and models to solve for equilibrium. In the analog method, the one on the right, you kind of do the same thing, but you get those design parameters from a reference reach, a reach that you presume to be in stable condition. And use it as a blueprint. And I don't think anybody these days ever does exclusively one method or the other, but they definitely are, and there certainly used to be two separate camps, and they really didn't get along with each other. This was the era of the Rosgen Wars, which was mostly about people disagreeing about how to do natural channel design. And looking, looking back, I wonder if all the turmoil and fighting that went on in those days wasn't really just about a simple disagreement over methods. I wonder if there was a lot more, if it was a lot more about a deeper insecurity about the whole natural channel design approach and whether it's really valid in most cases. I think people in those days were starting to realize that restoring natural streams and designing stable channels might often be two entirely different things. Reality check. Are we ever really confident we can nail sediment balance to build a stable, static channel in perfect equilibrium in nature? It sure doesn't seem like it. In almost all cases where I've seen natural channel design applied, you also get a healthy dose of bank hardening, grade control, and artificial structure. And I can't blame people for doing this. If I was being graded by the three stability commandments, if I was being graded on the ability of my channel to transport all of the stream flow and all the sediment of the watershed, if I was being graded on its ability to maintain a dimension pattern and profile in infinitum, and if I was being graded on whether it had the tendency to grade or degrade? Well, I'd add some safety factors too. 
I hate to be too hard on natural channel design and sediment balance because I truly believe that these were the process-based restoration concepts of their day. But that day's come and gone. There's still a place for natural channel design, don't get me wrong, but I don't think we should be confusing it with natural ecological stream restoration. Science has come a long way since the 1950s and we need to get along with the times. If we want to be doing stream restoration for ecological benefits, then it has to come down to whether the approach is helping us be successful in ecological river restoration. Does the goal of creating a static equilibrium channel go with the guiding image of a dynamic state? The way that Palmer and her colleagues said it should? Does creating a static equilibrium channel improve ecosystems? Always? Does it increase resilience? I'm afraid that stabilizing channels and trying to make them into a perfect equilibrium form often does quite the opposite. But of course I'm peeking over the top of my natural equilibrium paradigm glasses again. When Palmer et al. published their ecological standards paper, 2005, practitioners responded by defining these three categories. They said, you know, it's not just restoration. We've got some projects do restoration for restoration's sake, and some projects are really doing enhancement to try and um, enhance a specific function or a specific habitat type. And then other projects, the goal is simply to, to stabilize or contain a stream. The natural equilibrium paradigm would have us view these three categories as something of a sequence. Like the first order of business is to establish balance by stabilizing the system. And then we can start enhancing it by, um, then we can start enhancing it by adding habitat and other attractive features. And incrementally as we do that, we gain more and more um, towards the goal of restoration. And I guess by this view, it's probably no wonder that people feel comfortable using the term restoration for pretty much any activity they do that manipulates a, ri a river on any of these levels. But I see it differently. I see these three boxes as three different and often competing goals. The road to ecological restoration does not necessarily pass through control and stabilization. Oftentimes, it goes in entirely the opposite direction. We might gain benefits from controlling and enhancing rivers, and in certain circumstances, that's what we have to do to protect our infrastructure and protect land that has certain land uses that, that, that just can't tolerate natural processes. But if we're doing that, we really shouldn't expect a whole lot of ecological success until we're ready to embrace the guiding image of dynamic natural state. And that time's now. It's time to let go of the natural equilibrium paradigm. It was really convenient thinking of streams as simple ordered systems that are either in or out of balance, but when I really think about it, I know that isn't true. Static channel form and sediment balance are not universal criteria for stability. Stream functions are not simply a product of stable equilibrium. And restoration is not just about creating stable channels. In fact, it's often quite the opposite. It's going to be lonely without Lane, but it's time to move on. We're breaking up. It's Splitsville. Breaking up is never easy, but the sadness won't last forever. We'll be better off in the long run, but more importantly, so will our streams. And just in case you're wondering, Lane and I are still friends. We have nothing against Lane's balance. We just have to stop pretending it means more than it does. This equilibrium is okay. It's natural to be out of balance sometimes. Embrace your dynamic self and embrace your dynamic rivers. Thank you.